Today we get revenge by weaponizing Justin Bieber. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, house next door. I was seeing a guy who had separated from his ex quite a while beforehand. She found out about me and successfully did everything to ruin our relationship, along with making several threats to me over messages. I knew she was all talk and would never have the guts to follow through with any of the if I ever see you in person threats. Long story short, I found out where she lived and booked a viewing for the house next door that was up for sale. I made sure she saw me standing outside with the estate agent. Funnily enough, I never received another threat from her again, Petty, but put her in her place. What's the pettiest thing you've ever done? Not only are you showing that you're not afraid of them, you're willing to move in next door to them to prove a point. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is When Petty Creates a Book Dragon. This is from my childhood. Rotary phones, AC and cars wasn't standard, and written checks were common use. My mom could not only be petty, she could be a Karen and take things extremely literal at times. This normally happened when someone threatened her safety or her children's well-being and education. The players are M for mom, T for teacher, P for principal, and me. Backstory, I have dyslexia and as a young child had beyond deplorable reading skills. Deplorable enough, the school talked about holding me back a year to work on those reading skills. So my mom knew I would do just about anything for non-chore earnings. Took me to the city library and we made a deal for each book I read and each half page synopsis slash overview I wrote, I would receive a quarter. Think Dr. Seuss and Golden Books were right up my alley at the start. As my skills improved, the books became larger and longer because they and reading became less daunting. I'd graduated from Dr. Seuss to popular science publications, anthologies, and then to novels. The librarians were great help introducing and directing me to other books that seemed to perk my curiosity and also my mom didn't care what books I read as long as I read. Backstory done. I was walking from one class to the next, and a teacher stopped me and took my library book and refused to return it. When I refused to go to class and let said teacher keep my library book, the book and I were sent to the principal's office and mom was called. Mom arrived to see me sitting in a chair outside the principal's office, and after she was assured I'd not been physically harmed, she was introduced to the teacher and we were ushered into the principal's office. The teacher waves my book by my mom, and the teacher informs her I had it. Mom, confused, tells them she was with me when I checked it out. All these years later, I still mostly remember the conversation verbatim. The teacher said, this isn't appropriate for school. My mom says, a book isn't appropriate? She sighs, taps the book cover. This, tap tap, isn't appropriate. Mom says, again, it's a book. Huff. Teacher grabs the book and slams the principal's desk with each word. This is not appropriate for school. Not liking being talked down to, mom's voice is sharp. A book has words inside. Words inside a book educate. This is a place of education. How are words bound into a book in a school not appropriate? The teacher grabs the bridge of his nose. This is a place of education. This waves book is not appropriate in a place of education. Mom says, are you saying my child isn't allowed to have a public library book in a public school? The teacher looks to the principal, who gives teacher a continue wave and motion. The teacher tosses the book to mom, who looks at the book and back to him. This is inappropriate for a student. Mom hands me the book. Mom to me says, I love this book. When's it due back? The teacher to the principal says, really? You're going to encourage this? Mom stands and shushes any response that might happen to say something stupid. I can't believe you dragged my child here to be reprimanded for having a book. This is absolutely deplorable. The teacher says, a child shouldn't have that, it's inappropriate. Mom says, it's a book, she's reading. How can you say a dyslexic child reading is bad? They say, it's a banned book. Mom says, I don't care, she's reading. The principal says, whoa, whoa, mom, many school systems across the country have removed this book from circulation because it's been deemed inappropriate in those school districts. Teacher, this book isn't banned in this school district. Your recommendation for detention is revoked. 
Mom, to ensure this type of confusion doesn't happen again, in the public library books, stay at home. OP, I'll lift any and all age restrictions on the school library. You can check any of those out and they're approved for all reading ages in this school. I say, Mom, what's a banned book? My mom says, books that make little-minded people uncomfortable. I said, I want to read them all. Mom and I left the school. Our next library visit, I told the librarians all about banned books. How mom stuck it to the mean teacher and I wanted to read all the banned books they had. Mom said I could read all the banned books I wanted after I read her favorite book, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, by Tolstoy. I was in 8th grade when this happened, and a freshman in high school when I finally finished Tolstoy. If you're wondering what book I had that sent me to the principal office, Fahrenheit 451. In remembrance of this, I read each new book added to the banned book list when I hear of a book kerfuffle. I hope you enjoy this story about my mom. I have many. Definitely a lot of these banned books are things that are kind of pearl clutching. I think when I was younger, there was a number of books that were banned just because they had topics that revolved around stuff like LGBT. Our next story is Revenge Served Cold. In high school, I was a banquet waiter. I was setting up the tables and the event was just starting. I notice a guy in a wheelchair coming to the door. It's winter time and I hold the door open, waiting for him to come through. A Karen loudly complains, it's so cold, close the door, jeez. In comes the guy, I give her a look, and the guy comes in and thanks me. Well, about 45 minutes later, the event is in full swing. The hall seats about 250 people, so lots of tables and it's time to serve salad. Sometimes I have to haul a tray pull of 10 plates, and it can be a burden when you have to go to the other side of the room. I forget what happened, but one of the plates tips, and some of the bigger vegetables, tomatoes, etc. drop to the floor. I pick it up, put it back on the tray, carefully remembering not to serve it, and to bring it back when I serve the others. Well, wouldn't you know, I hear a familiar voice sarcastically sigh, say something to the effect of, I guess I'm not getting a salad. Ridiculous. All I can say is Karen got her salad right away. And I no longer need to worry about bringing the plate back on my tray. This next story is a little parking justice. Many moons ago, I went grocery shopping with my wife and toddler son. When we go shopping, we would typically park beside the cart return, as they usually get stuck in a way that if you park in the spot beside them, it gives you more space on one side of your vehicle. Very useful with small children. So we pull into this lot and spot an Escalade parked in the spot. No big deal, except they parked across two spots, essentially eating up two and a half parking spots. At the time, I drove a little square body Jeep Cherokee, and wouldn't you know it, it fit perfectly in the lines, an inch from the Escalade and well within the lines of the parking spot I chose. So we grab a cart from the return, no wacky wheel, my lucky day, and do our shopping. I keep an eye out for a privileged parker and as we ring out our bounty, I see a lady walking toward the truck. Oh boy. I see her slowly approach, then look around, pause, go all the way around my jeep and come back. She unloads her cart and returns it. These carts have coin deposits, so they usually get returned. She returns to her Escalade, then nothing. Doesn't move. Doesn't come back to the store looking for the hobo driving a clapped out jeep. Nothing just sits there. At this point, my wife is getting agitated as she doesn't like confrontation, but I'm petty and bored. We wander out slowly. As we round the vehicle, I see her huddling in her seat glued to her phone. She glances at me and averts her eyes just as fast. There was loads of space on the cart return side of her parking job, but I'm assuming her driving skills were as bad as her parking skills, so she couldn't figure out how to maneuver with my Jeep mirror an inch from her door handle. I'm loving it. I unload the groceries carefully. I don't want to squish the bread after all. At this point, my toddler starts asking questions about stuff. So I stop what I'm doing and answer the questions and then continue the groceries. I stop every time they ask something, then continue. After all the groceries are in place, I strap the kiddo carefully into his seat, then return the cart. All this time, the lady's on her phone, eyes darting to catch a glimpse at me, then back to her phone. Well, I'm too close on my driver's side to get in, so my wife gets out of the passenger side so I can slide on over to the driver's side. Wife gets back in, start the jeep, 
let it idle to warm up. All the while I'm staring right at this lady in the most possibly happy smile I can give her. I then wave at her and slowly drive away. I wasted a good 15 minutes of her time. Park in the lines, people, or park farther away if you fear door deans. If somebody does a really terrible parking job, is that justification enough to box them in and make them pay for it? Or are you being just as much of a jerk as them? Our next story is, clean up your dog's poop then, crazy lady. Edit to add that this happened seven to eight years ago. So, about eight years ago, my boyfriend and myself moved into a new apartment and had two kitties in our doggo. It looked nice, neighbors seemed quiet and easy to get along with. We quickly found out that, as far as the people living across the hall, that was not the case. They had a Yorkie. I love them. My parents Yorkie just passed away, and he was a very sweet boy. They let him poo on the front walkway and never cleaned it up. We were nice at first. It's not hard to pick up crap that you left behind. Asked her to please do it, yada yada. She would always say that she would, and then never do it. This is probably one of my best of all time petty revenge stories. I decided to pick them up, the three little mini Tootsie Roll poops. I decided to just pick them up every time and fill bags after bags, full of them. Fast forward nine months, we decide not to renew our lease and cited that as the main issue. Keep in mind, I've been saving these literal poop filled bags and stashing them in the communal shed the whole time. No one ever uses it, so no one ever saw them. At this point, I have four bags full of her dog's poop. We finished up cleaning and then dumped the massive amount of their own dog's poop in a gargantuan pile right in front of their door. Turds are now raining down the stairs, only used for the two upper apartments, from the pile being so large. After that, we locked up the apartment, put our keys in the mailbox, and left. I still wonder what everyone's faces looked like upon the discovery of it. We didn't get our deposit back, obviously. The satisfaction of just imagining her staring at it was so great. There is definitely being committed to a revenge, and then there's a collecting poop for 9 months level of committed. Our next story is, try to get out of returning my deposit. Many years ago, my family, two young boys and wife, took off for the holiday of a lifetime. 9 months of camping and driving right around Australia. Because of where we wanted to go, we were set up to be completely self-sufficient. We could comfortably be on our own, no contact with the outside world for more than two weeks. It also meant we got pretty good at setting up and breaking camp. After nearly 9 months and 42,000 kilometers, we were getting pretty homesick and excited to be getting close to home. So we were doing some pretty long driving days, second to last day comes and goes and we're still 500 kilometers from home in a fairly major town with just too much of a drive to get home that day. We could have continued a bit and camped out, but we decided to treat ourselves to a campsite in a tourist park. Easy hot showers without needing to light a fire and boil water. We booked in, and it was bloody expensive. The most expensive tourist park anywhere we had come across. They also demanded $20 as a security deposit for the toilet block key. Back then, 1994, $20 was a considerable amount of money. I was a bit put out and a bit wary of this bloke, so I asked him, do we get back this money? He says, yes, it's a deposit. I replied, we're leaving early in the morning about 7 o'clock. He says, no problem, we'll be up. Well, we have a good sleep, but are all excited to be nearly home, so we're up and packed by 7 o'clock. I go to the office to return the key and get our $20 back, But it's all locked tight and shut with curtains drawn. Jerk. I knew he had no intention of returning the deposit. Now a little word picture of the office setup. It's a two story wood framed structure with planks on the walls, office on the ground floor, living space above, a locked drop box to drop the keys in so they get the keys back and get to keep the deposit, a push button beside the door to summon someone to the office if they're down the back cleaning the toilets or whatever. The push button was a heavy welded steel cover locked in place, with a padlock over the button so they could ignore patrons if they wanted to. They had a bell wire from the covered push button running up the wall to a huge bell. This bell was meant to be heard if they were down the back mowing. I always carry a pocket knife when I'm camping. I'm also a technician, so I'm quite familiar with how these bells work. 
I grab the pocket knife and just gently push the blade through the insulation of the wire until it shorts the wires out. The bells ring loud enough to wake the dead. It was rattling the wooden walls. 30 seconds of that and the park bloke and all his family came down all in their pajamas and very grump about being woken so early. They had no idea how I got the bell to ring. They checked the padlock and the metal cover, grumping and mumbling the whole time. I smiled and handed him the key, and he went back in and got my $20. Five hours later, we were home. I'm a technician. I knew the bell was a 12-volt bell. No danger to anyone shorting it out. That's what the button does. Bell wire is like speaker cable. Two thin wires insulated from each other side by side. By pushing my knife in, I contacted the wires and completed the circuit. I had no qualms doing it. This jerk probably does this all the time, and makes quite a bit by not being there when people need to check out. I feel like I need to read a book based on OP's life story. Nine months of camping, experienced technician, pocket knife tricks. Our next story is, mother-in-law hates our Christmas cards. Both my mother and father-in-law express their antiquated views on societal gender roles every time they see me and my husband. Women are supposed to do X, men should do Y, blah blah blah. Fast forward to this Christmas, we moved into a new house and sent Christmas cards with our new address. We hosted the in-laws and upon arriving to our new house this year, the first thing my mother-in-law says to me is, I notice you put your name first instead of husband's name. The husband's name should always go first. I laughed and brushed it off because she's brought this up several times before. To prepare, I actually wrote my husband's name first on the Christmas gift label so I wouldn't have to hear her complain. But to be petty, I discreetly went upstairs and put new labels on all of their gifts with my name first so she would be irritated with every gift she opens. Not that elaborate of a story, but those that have to deal with annoying in-laws and family members around the holidays will hopefully understand. Our next story is, try to intimidate me? I'll tell everyone just what you said. I had a terrible experience at a dental office and left a detailed review that I'd classify as scathing. A few minutes later, I got a notification that the business had responded. The first few paragraphs were a bunch of nonsense, but at the bottom, the manager said, we may consider listening to our legal team about their concerns and the need to take legal action as long as the review still exists on Google, obviously trying to intimidate me to delete the post. Who is dumb enough to threaten to sue a customer for leaving a bad review on a public post where everyone can see that's your response to criticism? Not only did I keep the review up, at the top I added an update with the threat in all caps. I attached a screenshot of it so whenever people click to see the images of the business, it'll pop up. I also went on Yelp, Facebook, their website, and literally every single place I could leave a review and made sure to include the threat. I know it's nothing major, but they cost me $1,500, so I hope I drive away at least that much business from them. Yeah, that's just a terrible look. And I would hope that any legal advice or legal team would tell those owners as much. To be fair though, they probably like getting those billable hours. This next story is, my mom got petty revenge on neighbors. So this happened a few years ago. We live in a rural area. There's one neighbor who lives about 200 meters further from our house. They have to use our road and a front yard in order to get to their house, which we don't mind and allow. Their house is also surrounded by a fence and is very nice in general. Well, the neighbors have a dog that they take for a walk past our house. The dog would often poop on our front yard and they didn't pick it up. My mom got mad and told them, but they would say, it's not their dogs, but from our dog. Not true, our dog always goes to poop far away from the house near the forest. We also had seen the dog poop and they just walk away. And then we have to clean it up. Well, one time when it happened again, my mom had enough. She got the shovel, picked up all the poop she found, walked 200 meters with the shovel and poop, and threw the poop over the fence on their nicely cleaned front yard. In her words, now they have to clean it up. I still laugh every time I remember. This next story is, patient was aggressive over nothing, he gets a nice long wait to sit by himself in time out. I work in a busy eye clinic. I saw that a patient named Tyler was marked as waiting, so I marked the chart as taken, saw what he was here for, and checked that he was the only Tyler in the waiting room, my usual routine. 
It's a long walk to the waiting room, so I don't even bother trying to memorize the last names anymore. I usually forget or butcher them by the time I get to the front. The patients have a sheet that are very specific to the doctor they're seeing, has their name, date of birth, MRN, doctor's name, and the appointment time. I've never taken the wrong patient back, even when there were several patients with the same name I called. Well anyways, I get to the waiting room, call for Tyler while standing at the door about 30 feet from the waiting chairs. No movement from anyone. The waiting room is packed with at least 30 people. I call again two times, and finally a guy on the phone says, What's the last name? I ask if his name's Tyler, and the dude again asks, What's the last name? I honestly don't know, but like I said, he's the only Tyler there. I tell him to just come on back, and he asks again what's the last name, remaining seated, not giving me his paper. I tell him it's a HIPAA violation for me to announce full names, which honestly I'm not sure if it is, but I know that I'm supposed to limit PHI as much as possible, and there was no reason to announce his full name to 30 people. And again, I don't know the last name because I've never needed to know it before opening the chart again. I tell him that it looks like you're the only Tyler here. Come on back and I'll check your paper. Nope. He wasn't having it. As an aside, I would totally understand not wanting to get up for no reason if he was elderly but the man was in his 30s. Finally, I just cross the extra 30 feet and I literally have to take the paper out of his hand. He didn't hand it to me and make sure I recognize the full name, appointment time, doc, etc. It's literally not possible that it's the wrong Tyler. I said, yep, you're Tyler. All the way back to the exam room, this guy is absolutely fuming. I explained to him that he was the only Tyler in the waiting room, but if he wasn't, all he had to do was promptly hand me his sheet so I could confirm he was the right guy. I tell him it's never been a problem before. Surely he's seen that everyone else just gets up and walks to the door to the back, hands their sheet over, and we continue to a room. I try to make small talk to shift the mood on the way to the exam room. He's not taking it, not calming down a bit, just absolutely fuming for… what? So we get to win an exam room finally after this guy's been huffing and making comments under his breath the whole walk. I tell him to sit in the black chair, he sits in one of the guest chairs that are red. I repeat myself and he huffily moves, like toddler huffing and puffing when they're mad. I ask him how his vision is doing, and he says it's the same as last time. I ask him if he has X symptoms, and he huffs and says everything is the same as last time. I ask him again, because it'll take 5-6 to six minutes to look through his chart to open the right encounter, then the note, then the detailed report, scroll through 6 pages to the bottom, etc., versus the 10 seconds for him to just answer me. At this point, it's taken twice as long to get this guy in the right chair and to get through the first four questions that I usually get answered before I even log into the computer. I tell him we would be halfway done already if he just cooperated. Guy gets huffed and puffed again and asks to see someone else. The magic words. I tell him that's a great idea with a huge smile under my mask. Leave the room and waste about 20 minutes deleting all my input from his chart. Then, I ask the slowest coworker possible, literally struggles to pry her eyes from her phone to look at the schedule to take him. She always takes patients and sits on her phone forever so that she ends up taking less patients throughout the day. She won't take crap from anybody, the biggest witch in the office to be honest. I couldn't have found a meaner, set in her ways, stubborn, quick to anger person to set on him. I tell her there's no rush. Doc is behind anyways, and by the time she goes in, it's been 50 minutes since I left him in the room. She literally had to ask the exact same questions I did, so not sure why he thought it'd be different. I took a different patient who was a compliant sweetheart and was done before the coworker went in with Tyler. The guy checked in at 1pm and didn't leave till 4. Hopefully the extra 50 minutes in time out gave him time to calm down from his hissy fit so he wasn't a jerk to everyone else in the office. If he would have just stuck it out with me and played nice and answered my questions, I average about 9 minutes for a full workup. Usually I say people you don't want to mess with are people that work fast food and handle your food, but another person you don't want to piss off and upset are the people that are trying to make sure your health is okay and that you're getting taken care of. This next story is, I assembled my first Lego set out of spite. It's straight from The Simpsons Season 1, Episode 9. 
Homer gets Marge a bowling ball for her birthday. He loves the bowl and she doesn't even know how. So instead of letting him enjoy the ball, she gets lessons and uses it herself. So my husband loves to Lego. I do not. I've watched him spend countless hours poring over every new set. I think it's dumb, but I don't mess with him because everyone needs something to relax and enjoy. There are worse things a guy could do. This year's Christmas, he gifted himself some new sets. It seemed to me like he had had enough already for one holiday season, and then another one arrived in the mail. This one was for me because the set is based on one of my favorite TV shows, but he could put it together for me if I want. He did this last year too, so this year I decided to take it, if it really is for me. I said, oh no, that's okay, I want to do it. The look of shock and amazement on his face was worth it. He was freaking stunned. I still think they're dumb, but something's satisfied about putting the set together. I mean, he can't complain, he literally got it for you. Our next story is, my neighbor wouldn't respect me, so I weaponized Justin Bieber. I live in a fairly large apartment building in a medium-sized city. I moved in here last year, and throughout the year, my biggest issue has been an older gentleman who lives next door to me. This man likes to blast his stereo and TV simultaneously at all hours of day and night. When I first moved here, I introduced myself to the man and explained to him that the noise coming from his apartment was making my apartment unlivable. Despite that fact, he continued, Over time, my complaints toward him turned into him suggesting I wanted him sexually. I don't even know where he came up with that, but eventually I went to the building management about the problem. I know they discussed it with him, but nothing changed. Anyway, today I haven't really been feeling well and all I wanted to do was nap on and off and watch movies. I had been doing that all day until 8.30pm where I was rudely awoken to the sounds of my neighbor's stereo blasting. I don't know if waking up in what felt like a nightclub had something to do with it, but in my sleepy state I was fuming and determined to punish my neighbor for yet again blasting music. I have a tiny Bluetooth speaker, but it's one of the ones that packs a serious punch. So I put it on full blast and played what I thought would annoy someone the most, Justin Bieber. Halfway through Justin singing My Girl, my neighbor turned down the music. I quickly turned off my blasting music as well, but I think he got the point. So now I really think that's going to be my way to deal with loud, rude neighbors from now on. I think bottom line here. If the apartment people aren't going to do anything about it, if you try to file a noise complaint and that doesn't do anything about it, and certainly being civil with them doesn't do anything, sometimes you just gotta explain to them why it's just so darn annoying. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.